This morning we're going to be in the very small book of Philemon, Philemon, uh, there near the end of the New Testament. A great little letter that Paul wrote uh, to his church, uh, to actually to uh, his friend Philemon, but it was, it was read in, before the entire church. And uh, we're going to focus on just a couple of verses there towards the beginning uh, here in just a moment. But each week regularly, not just once a week, but regularly and often as I'm seeking to lead and preach and prepare, often I'll ask, God, what do you want your people to hear? God, what do you want to say to us through your word? God, what do we need to hear? What do we need to know? Not what would I like to preach or what what do I think would be cool or good or that people would like, but God, what do you want us to hear? God, what do we need to hear from you? It's a question that I regularly ask God in prayer. Whether I'm in the middle of a planned sermon series and working through a book or working through a topic or working through a theme, or whether I'm working week by week with just individual standalone sermons trying to figure out what God's leading us to, I ask these questions. And I hope that you'll begin to ask these questions about, God, what, what, what do you want me to hear? God, what do you want to say to me through your word? And today, as I've been praying specifically about what God wants us to hear and what he wants to say to us and speak to us, in this season of life, I believe that he wants us to seek to be a blessing. He wants to remind us and challenge us that we have an incredible opportunity to be a blessing to one another through Christ. Now, Paul wrote many letters uh, to churches, many letters uh, to individuals. And, and one of them was uh, to his friend Philemon. And he was urging him to show love, to show forgiveness uh, to Onesimus, who was a, a slave of his who had stolen from him and had run away. And so it was kind of a sticky situation. But Paul knew that the Christian thing to do was to forgive and to love and to set example for the others in the church in the ways of Christ. And he was urging him to show this love, to show this forgiveness. Now, now Paul and Philemon were good friends. Uh, they were close. They had a, a very close relationship. And Paul and Onesimus had a close relationship. Because when he ran away, he ran to Paul. And Paul uh, encouraged him. Paul led him in the ways of the Lord. And, and Philemon was an influential Christian, a layman, a businessman in his church. And I love how Paul speaks so honorably about Philemon. And I've been struck by one of these verses, and my prayer is that others would be able to honestly speak the same about us. So in the introduction to Philemon in this book, picking up in verse 4, Paul writes to Philemon, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers, because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that's in us for the glory of Christ. And I love verse 7. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. I believe Philemon can be described as a refreshing Christian, an encouraging Christian. And I don't believe that being a refreshing Christian, being an encouraging Christian, is one of the spiritual gifts that either you've got it or you don't have it. Encouragement can be this extra special gift that, that someone is given and blessed with in an extra measure. But we can all be encouragers. We can all express encouragement. We can all be refreshing and encouraging to one another. And I desire to be a refreshing Christian as Philemon was to his brothers and sisters in Christ. And I desire for all of us to be refreshing Christians to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Philemon strengthened and encouraged other Christians in their faith by the way he loved them and the way he served them with joy. See, it wasn't some 
complicated process. It wasn't this uh, multi-faceted uh, plan that he had to work through and learn and discover and go to all these classes and all this training and get all this education on. Just out of the overflow of his love for Jesus. Philemon loved other people. He encouraged other people. He refreshed other people. And he encouraged them in their faith by the way that he loved them and the way that he served them with joy. And you and I need to do the same. And and I believe that one of the greatest needs that we have as Christians today, one of the greatest needs among Christians today is to experience joy and encouragement. And and I'm I'm talking about about pastors. Pastors need encouragement more uh, more than ever before. The more I read, the more I interact with pastors, more and more pastors are stepping away. More and more pastors are are getting burnt out uh, and are done, and they just just can't take it anymore. They can't handle it anymore. Church staff and leadership in the church need joy and encouragement more than anything else. Deacons in the church, servants in the church, church members in general, our world in general needs to experience joy and encouragement. The level of discouragement among everyone but I'm seeing it more and more among Christians, is rapidly increasing. Discouragement is on the rise. It's uncertain times. And many of us are somewhat separated and isolated from from one another in some way or another. And as Christians, we're supposed to be together. As Christians, we're supposed to, to, to share life together. There's political turmoil. There's economic struggles. There's health concerns. One of the greatest needs among Christians, I believe, in this season and in this time, is the need to experience joy and encouragement. But, but let me be clear. Let me clarify something. Because I don't ever want, want to be the, the moralistic preacher that tries to encourage you well, that if we just love others and, and encourage others and help others, then we're doing uh, what we need and we're, we're having our needs met. Our greatest need is Jesus Christ. Always has been and always will be. And we're sinners that need to be rescued by the grace of Jesus Christ. That is our greatest need. There is no greater need than our need for Jesus. But even after we become Christians, and even after we become part of the church, and even uh, as we're growing in our faith, we still need joy. We still need encouragement. And that primarily comes from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. If you are seeking joy anywhere other than Jesus, you're looking in the wrong place. If you're seeking encouragement and refreshing and renewal in your life anywhere else apart from Jesus Christ, you're seeking it in the wrong place. But as Christians, God's given us a calling to share life together and a community and to encourage one another, to hold one another accountable. And we can be a great source of joy and encouragement by the way we love one another, by the way we serve one another with joy. Christians need to be built up and encouraged. Just like the, the world out there that doesn't know Jesus and is hopeless. We too are struggling. We too are suffering. We too are hurting. There's so many needs in this room that I'm looking at across the room. And most of them I'm not aware of. But if we sat down one-on-one and we started talking about life. We started sharing our struggles. Sharing our concerns and our fears and our worries. And so many of you who are watching us and, and joining us online this morning. Your life, my life, our life is full of struggling and and suffering and and, and difficulty and hurting. We're troubled people in the midst of our circumstances. And I'm so encouraged by Philemon and the way Paul speaks so boldly to him. Now, Now, I know Paul's writing him this letter because he's asking him for something, right? And I know that oftentimes when we need something from someone or we want to encourage someone, then we're, we're going to kind of start out on the right foot. We're going to say something good about them, right? Oh, mommy, I love you so much. Can I have dessert? You know, but Paul's not a liar. Paul, Paul's not using flattery here. He, he's, he's being encouraging. He's, he's exemplifying what, what we're to exemplify. So don't, so don't mistake Paul's words of encouragement that he's just buttering him up so that he can ask him for what he needs and encourage him for what he wants. Paul's speaking from his heart. Paul's sharing a testimony of his own life. Philemon, you have encouraged me. You've inspired me with your love, the way you encourage one another. And all the saints have been refreshed because of you. 
because of your love, because of your encouragement. And Philemon was able to bless and refresh fellow Christians. He was a peacemaker. He was a a man of kindness. He was a blessing to others. And based on what Paul said about him, his love helped strengthen the entire Christian community. Do you know people like that? That one person that just seems to be an encouragement to everybody? The the one that everybody could share testimony about uh, when you were down or when you were discouraged or when you needed it the most. Somehow, someway, that person just said the right thing or did the right thing or was in the right place at the right time to bring you the encouragement and joy that you needed. That was Philemon. He He lived out the love of Jesus with joy and with excitement and with encouragement. And based on what Paul said about him, his love helped strengthen the entire Christian community. Other believers were encouraged in their faith. Other believers were compelled to grow in love and in service because of Philemon's life and example. And and Paul is recognizing that here. And Philemon's heart has been changed by the love of Christ. And as a result, he extends that love to others. His loving, caring nature was refreshing to the hearts of fellow believers in the church and the community. You see, the simplicity of love is powerful and influential. And Philemon was a great example and influence in the church. And the reason that he goes to Philemon is he knows that his track record has served him well in encouraging and loving and leading by example. And he said, here's another, here's an opportunity for you. Here's an opportunity for you to have a big impact on your church and on your community. Extend love and extend grace and forgiveness to this brother that I'm sending back to you. He desires to be restored. He desires to be a part of the church uh, and and the Christian family. And and you see, Philemon was such a great example and influence in his church. Why? Because his heart had been changed by the love of Jesus Christ. And and you're never really going to be able to to truly encourage others. You're never really going to be able to, to refresh others and pour joy into the lives of others until you first have experienced the love and the joy and the refreshing grace of Jesus Christ in your heart. You see, we're created for community. And God's blessed us with brothers and sisters in Christ so we don't have to face this Christian life alone. Aaron said that last week in preaching on worship that, that we're not Lone Ranger Christians. We're not intended to just go out there and, and conquer the world on our own. We're to do it together. And one of the best ways to help other people grow spiritually is to refresh them and encourage them. And when we intentionally love one another, we intentionally invest in fellow believers, it fuels our faith. And it fuels their faith. It inspires us to keep going. It inspires them to keep going, to be a blessing to others. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, uh, it says, Let us hold to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. What the writer of Hebrews is saying is let's hold firm to our faith in Jesus Christ. Let that be the foundation of everything that we are. Don't waver in that. And let us watch out for one another. Why? Why? To provoke love and good works. He goes on to say, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Hold firm to your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't waver in your commitment to Him and your dependence upon Him. But as you move forward, encourage one another, love one another help one another. Church, we're not alone. We're joined together in Jesus Christ. We have that common bond of faith in Christ. We share the same Savior and the same purpose, and we need to help strengthen and encourage and love one another. Because you see, our lives are either building people up or we're tearing people down. Our words, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you Oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We looked at that verse a couple of weeks ago. Our words are either building people up or they're tearing people down. We're either helping people grow in their faith or we're hindering people from growing in their faith because our actions and our decisions affect one another. So I ask you, are you encouraging others? Are you exhausting others? You know those people in your life, right? Like I said a moment ago, those people that are always encouraging you, 
those people that you want to be around, those people that, 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 that fill you and help you and strengthen you through their love with the Lord, they're encouraging you. And unfortunately, we all know those other people that we spend time with and that we're around. The people that just exhaust us, that just wear us out. They just seem to walk away discouraged after you've, you, you've talked to them or an encounter that you've had with them. And that may not be something they directly said to you, but it's just kind of their perspective and their a- approach to life. And, you know, it's a lot more fun when we're hanging out with Tigger than it is when we're hanging out with Eeyore. We need a lot more Tiggers and a lot fewer Eeyores in the church today. Because church is supposed to be a happy place. Christianity is supposed to be the most joyful, abundant life. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. Satan wants to do everything he can to suck the joy and the meaning and the significance out of your life. And he wants to discourage you. But Jesus says, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The Christian life is a fun life. The Christian life is a joyful life. The Christian life is an encouraging life. So why don't we start living it? Why don't we start sharing it? Why don't we start showing it and encourage one another and inspire one another? You see, your life, your words, your actions, your presence is impacting more people than you think, so we need to make it count. Be a blessing to others with your love. Be a blessing to others with your love. If, that's, if, there, if there's one takeaway from what God wanted me to say today, it would be this. Be a blessing to others with your love. It really does matter how well we love others, whether we refresh them or exhaust them. And only a life that's been transformed by the radical grace of Jesus Christ can be used by God to help transform the lives of others. If you're trying to make an impact, you're trying to make a difference in this world, you're trying to make an impact in the lives of other people, if you're doing that apart from Jesus Christ, then your efforts are futile. The joy won't last, the encouragement won't last, the inspiration won't last. Only a person whose heart's been rescued by God, who's been renewed by God's amazing and relentless love, can be a source of refreshment to others. Philemon was made new in Christ. His heart was changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And through his relationship with Jesus, he was intentional in loving his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because he wanted to strengthen them. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to refresh them. Intentionally love your fellow believers so that you can be a source of strength and encouragement to them. How can I be a source of strength and encouragement? How can I intentionally love my fellow believers? I'm glad you asked. Three thoughts. First, affirm them. Affirm them for who they are in Christ. Speak truth into their life. Remind them that they're made in the image of God, that they're loved by God, and that their their worth before God is not based on what they do or what they've done or what they haven't done. Their, their, Their works. Affirm to them who they are in Christ and where their identity and worth come from. Speak in truth to them. Speak encouragement to them. Remind them how valuable they are to God, how how much love God has for them. Second, engage them. Engage them and include them in your life so they have a place to belong. So they, they have relationships. That's, that's a key part of what the church is about. We, we gather to scatter. We gather you know, each week as, as a rallying cry to be refreshed and be renewed and to to basically to get our marching orders at the command post on Sunday morning so that we can go out and live for Jesus the rest of the week. So that we can be refreshed, so that we can be renewed. <clears throat> but, but we need to be engaged and involved with other believers, not just on Sunday morning in our worship service <clears throat> and, and our, our small groups and in, and in other areas of our lives. Engage them, include them in your life so they have a place to belong. Invite them to fellowship with you. Invite them to fellowship with others. 
just to in- include them in your life. So many people just want to be included, right? So many people just t- w- want to be a part of what's going on and what's happening. Include people into your life, and you'll be amazed at how much encouragement they'll feel from that, how much love they'll glean from that. And then seek to meet needs in their life. Share your resources with them. Give your time, give your money, give your practical skills where you can to help someone. You have no idea the level of encouragement that can come from that. You you want an example of that? You can go read Acts chapter 2, the story of the church. Uh, Make a note this week to go read Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost and seeing thousands come to know Christ. But see what happens after that and how, how the church is described, how Luke describes the church and explains what they did and what they were doing. And that they, they shared their possessions and they, they spent time together and, uh, and all of these things. And they were encouraging one another and strengthening one another because they were scared and they were uncertain. And they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. So affirm them. Include them. Help meet their needs. Those are practical ways that we can love one another, that we can encourage one another intentionally in our lives. Now, and I'll say this kind of like I said in the beginning. We can, we can affirm people, we can include people, and we can help people. But if we're not doing it in the foundation of Jesus Christ, then it's not going to have the significance that God intended it to have. Ultimately, our primary need is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There is no one, there is nothing that supersedes our need for a Savior. We're imperfect and we're hopeless without the intervention of Jesus Christ on our behalf. We need His forgiveness so that we can have access to God, so that we can have hope to live for His glory, so that we can have a relationship with Him. And our goal must primarily be not just to help people, not just to encourage people, as I'm challenging us to do from God's Word today. We have to back up and reinforce the foundation. Our goal must be to take the hope of the gospel to those who need to be changed by His love and His grace. That's our primary purpose. And I'll go back to what Aaron said last week, reiterating what I've preached many, many times, that our purpose is to glorify God. That's foundationally who we are. Our purpose is to glorify God. And how do we glorify God? We glorify Him through our mission, through through our battle plan, through our agenda in this world that He's given us. And that's to help people find and follow Jesus. To help people find and follow Jesus. That's our primary purpose. That's our primary cause. And so I want to reinforce the foundation today. That our purpose is to glorify God. And the means by which we seek to do that is helping people find and follow Jesus. Helping people come to faith in Christ. Helping people grow in their faith in Christ. And helping people follow Jesus is helping people find encouragement. Helping people find joy. Helping people find love. Helping people find their place in the Christian community and in the church. This must always be the foundation of who we are and what we do. But in addition to this, as, as, as we springboard off of that, let's seek to be a blessing to our fellow build, believers, building up one another in faith. Why? Paul says it in Colossians 1.10, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. Why do we need to be an encouragement? Why do we need to be a source of joy? Why don't we strive to be more like Philemon in the church and the Christian community, refreshing the hearts of the saints so that together all of us may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. You see, as we help others be encouraged, as we help others be refreshed, it's interesting how God works all this out. When we encourage and refresh others, guess what? We experience encouragement. We experience refreshing through our faith in Jesus Christ. Your love, your encouragement to someone else may just be what they need to keep them going and them not want to quit, them not want to give up, them not want to disengage. Your intentional investment in someone else may give them confidence to find their gift to serve Him and to follow Him more faithfully and more completely. But what does it mean to be a blessing? Uh, Speaking of these verses, uh, writer, author, 
Pastor William Barclay said this. It's a lengthy quote, but I want to read it to you. He says, this means that we learn about Christ by giving to others. It means that we receive from Christ by sharing with others. It means that by emptying ourselves, we're filled with Christ. It means that the the poorer we make ourselves, the richer we are in the gifts of Christ. It it means that to be open-handed and generous-hearted is the surest way to learn more and more of the wealth of Christ. The man who knows most of Christ is not the intellectual scholar, nor even the saint who shuts himself up and spends all his days in prayer. But the man who moves in loving generosity among his fellow men. That's what it means to be a blessing. Now I'll say this, 2020 has been all kinds of things, right? And I know many of us are hoping that 2021 is going to be better, but what does scripture tell us? It's just going to get worse and it's going to get worse and it's going to get worse until the day of Jesus comes. So just go ahead and prepare yourself that it may or may not ever get better. It may only get worse as the world moves to the return of Christ. But 2020, let's say, it's one for the books. If it's been anything, it's been a hot mess. But I believe there's some great blessings yet to come in 2020. I believe there's some great joy yet to be experienced in 2020. I believe there's some great encouragement yet to be experienced and given in 2020. In fact, I believe the greatest blessings of 2020 very well could be in this room today. Very well could be those of you who are watching with us online at home today. That's you. That's me. That's us. We have the potential through Jesus Christ to be what Philemon was to Paul what Philemon was to his church community. So many wild and crazy aspects of 2020 will always be remembered and we will never forget them. But how will you be remembered in 2020? How will you be remembered at the end of this crazy year? Are are they going to, hopefully others are going to speak well of you. Hopefully you can be the bright spot for Christ in 2020. How how are you going to be remembered? As someone who built people up, who tore people down. A great example of this is a text message I got this morning. A text message I got as I was getting ready to to come to church today, coming to work today from from a church member and a friend said, I had a wonderful time. This, this was the text message. I had a wonderful time with the Lord this morning on 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm praying for you and your family. Go forward with confidence, brother. God's got your back. Love you, brother. Same person. A month or more ago sent me a text. God laid you on my heart. And I wrestled with the Lord and and committed to pray Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19 over you and your family every single day and ask God to sustain you, ask God to strengthen you, ask God to bless you. Folks, those are the things that keep us going. Those are the things that encourage us. Those are the things that inspire us. The letter or the note that says, you specifically said this, or this passage specifically encouraged me in this way. You did this for me. People have practically helped. I, I, I could go on all these, th- these practical ways that I explained that we need to love, we need to affirm people, we need to include people, and we need to help people. I, I've been on the receiving end of that time and time and time and time and time again. And I'll tell you, it's many of those things that keep me going. It's many of those things that get me out of bed, that keep me from banging my head against the wall, that keep me from wanting to give up and throw in the towel. The encouragement, the love, and the support of brothers and sisters 
in Christ is invaluable to our souls, invaluable to our hearts, invaluable to our lives. Paul said in Philemon verse 7, chapter 1 verse 7, there's really only one chapter, so it's either Philemon 1 7 or it's Philemon 7, I'm not sure. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Can anybody say that about you? Can anybody say that about us? If we become intentional with our love, seeking to bring joy and encouragement to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ through the grace of Jesus that we've received ourselves. The rest of 2020 could be one of the best years of our lives. And and I hope and pray that people look back and say, I I remember the pandemic and I I remember this and I remember that and I remember that insane out of control election and I remember these things and I remember those things. But what I remember most is through all of that, the way he loved me, the way he encouraged me, the way he did this for me, the way that she loved me, the way that she encouraged me, the way that she did this for me. That's what kept me going. That's what gave me hope. That's what gave me joy. Are others being refreshed and blessed through you? There's still plenty of time to encourage one another. There's still plenty of time to empower others through Christ in 2020. Your encouragement, your blessing to someone else may be just what they need to not give up, to keep going, and to help them renew their purpose in Christ and be refreshed in their relationship with Jesus. Be a blessing. Father, help us to be a blessing. Help us to live with intentional love, intentional encouragement, that we only by your grace and only through your presence in us might we be able to bring joy to the hearts and lives of one another. God, help our foundation to be in you. Help us never to neglect our purpose of sharing you and telling others about you. But Lord, as we seek to live the way that you've called us to live and to seek to be the salt and the light that you've called us to be in this hopeless world, God, may may we be the encouragement. May we be the joy that others need. Lay people upon our hearts. Help us to, to be intentional and disciplined in sending that note and sending that text or making that call or praying that prayer. And Lord, little by little, piece by piece, begin a sense of revival, a sense of renewal that floods the hearts of believers that no matter how hopeless it gets in this world, that you are our hope And you've called us to exemplify your hope to the world in whatever way that is. God, God, bring us to life today for you. Nothing nothing is hopeless without you. Nothing is impossible without you. And God, as we sing this song, as we remember that you bring dead things back to life, again. How amazing it is that you brought your son Jesus Christ from heaven to earth for us. And that you let him die so that you could bring him back to life again so that we might have hope in you for all of eternity. And God, that we wouldn't waste this life that we've been given for Christ, but that we would use it for your glory and for your honor. Help us, not in our own strength, not in our own wisdom, but only in you and through you. God, help us to be a blessing to this world today. 
that a revival of love and grace and hope might begin right now, right here in the hearts of these believers. Father, we want to be a blessing for your glory and for your name. Empower us to do that today. And maybe that means surrendering our lives to Christ if they're watching online or if they're in this room. Lord, that they wouldn't they wouldn't go through the rest of their day without seeking out what it means to follow Jesus. And Lord, that through our worship and through our time together this morning, that we would be renewed, that we would be strengthened, that we would be encouraged. Father, help us through our intentional love to be a blessing and an encouragement to one another. In Jesus' name we pray. A stand.